Welcome to Copcast. I'm Rumbi Chakamba, Associate Editor at DevEx, and I've headed to Sham el Sheikh in Egypt for this year's United Nations Climate Conference. In this podcast series, we bring you inside the walls of the Blue Zone for a series of in depth conversations with climate and development leaders, asking them the big questions. What's really needed to make meaningful progress towards climate goals, and what role should the development community play to support that? When you measure what happened uh, between 2015 and 2022, I think there are reasons uh, to be optimistic, I mean, and to see that things are happening. Is the UN Climate Conference still relevant, or is it just a talking shop for global leaders? Remy Ryu, CEO of the French development agency AFD, was a chief negotiator of the Paris Agreement and is probably the best person to weigh in on this question. Our senior reporter, William Worley, sat down with him to get his views on how far COP has come and the controversy surrounding Egypt's presidency of COP27. Hi, Remy. Thank you so much for joining us here. Remy, you helped to negotiate the Paris Agreement. Um, what are your thoughts on COP since then and how it's evolved? Is this just a talking shop? No, it's not, yes. I was, uh, I was the chief negotiator on uh, finance uh, in 2015 in Paris. Um, and I value the role of COP. I mean, we, we, we need to have a rendezvous uh, every year. Uh, at least for all of us to be accountable to the commitments we made. That's one. <laughs> Second is it's very, it's the only place we meet with uh, all the parties, including those that disagree <laughs> with us uh, or with others and try to, to find a, a, a compromise. Uh, and then there are cops when we really move forward. So um, it's and, and you see in Glasgow last year, for two years we had no cup and and and, and, it, and it was it was dearly needed uh, to to meet again. Back in 2015, uh, we tried to um, have the climate finance agenda uh, structure um, and deploy. And so we really, for more than a year, we went to see uh, each uh, family, each segment of the financial system and ask them, what are you doing for climate? And back in 2015, believe me, uh, sometimes we had <laughs> really no answer. Uh, and so when you look back, of course, uh, it's a yearly exercise, so there's a bit of frustration. But, but when you measure what happened uh, between 2015 and 2022, I think there are reasons uh, to be optimistic, I mean, and to see that things are happening. The problem with the COP and the numbers, though, is you go to some people, they will tell you one number, you go to another report, and they will kind of tell you an, a, another number. And some people are unhappy with the amount of finance that no, there I has agree, been. I, yeah. But another p issue that has been raised at this COP is, and this has kind of grown as a COP has become a bigger thing, is some people say it's an opportunity for, for greenwashing. What do you make of that? Well, there, there, are, there are several questions in your, in your question. The first one is, uh, uh, yes, there's a, there's a lot of confusion uh, when we talk about climate finance. Um, and we have to clearly distinguish two issues uh, that are sometimes and very often mixed up. The, the one issue is uh, how much do we need uh, to finance what nobody's financing, <laughs> meaning uh, Ad adaptation, meaning now loss and damage, uh, and with a focus, in my view, in uh, uh, LDCs and seeds. I mean, really the most vulnerable part uh, of the world. So somehow this was what was the 100 billion of Copenhagen about. But you know the perimeter is way larger, um, and somehow it's linked with the old world of ODA, uh, DEVEX knows well about. So really, we should start by discussing uh, what is this pot of finance we need, really, uh, to help uh, the poorest and the most vulnerable, because they are the same. So really, I invite the parties, I invite G20, UN, to, to, to give um, clarity on this and, tr and create trust enough so that we can open <laughs> the other discussion, uh, 
uh, which is uh, producing other figures, <laughs> true, uh, more about trillions, which is how could we uh, mobilize uh, private finance for mitigation mostly. And, and how could we uh, mobilize private finance mostly uh, in um, the countries that are emitting the most, meaning uh, emerging world uh, today, uh, which have not yet engage their transition. But, but really it's two different public policies. It, we, we, it's, no, it's not billions to trillions. I mean, this was a false uh, message. And, and somehow it, it created some sort of reaction. Okay, you, you will forget the poorest. Uh, you're only thinking about uh, your own. So it's really the issue is it's about billions and as many billions as need, needed and trillions. So it's, you see what I mean? And, and for now, we, the world is, um, of international finance is more about ODA on one side and climate finance on the other side. And it, it's, 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 it has become totally unclear. So my view, and, and we wrote a small, a small paper called uh, ODA at the Edge of Consequences, we just released before COP, uh, COP27, is, is we have to rearrange that, redefine that, so that we find a narrative <laughs> that is able to convince uh, our own citizens. We're talking of trust in narratives, you mentioned loss and damage a couple of times. Where does France stand on loss and damage? Will you be providing any loss and damage financing in the near future? So for a long time, you know, loss and damage was somehow uh, equivalent to adaptation. Uh, uh, and um, there was no recognition of this uh, dimension, I would say, of climate justice. Uh, in uh, in the negotiation, well, this time has come to an end, uh, and I can only uh, uh, repeat uh, what President Macron said uh, on Monday. So he was he was very clear. Um, it was a long part uh, in his uh, speech uh, that uh, well, we have to to give some recognition uh, to this. What I hear in, in in on the sidelines is that now that this. Uh, the dimension of climate justice is recognized. Parties are willing to turn to solutions. Could, could you, as, a, as an agency, you had a, a very large development agency, could you see yourself providing financing for loss and damage in, in the near future? Do you think that's a reasonable or, or realistic expectation? If it means investing in an early alert system uh, that's not to loss prevent and damage. catastrophe, that's not loss and damage. That's if it's about developing uh, insurance schemes, uh, and a capacity, or at AFD, we are, uh, uh, you know, we are providing contingency lending, for instance, so that. But you uh, know, that's not enough. That's not what they're asking for. But it it, it can provide resources uh, automatically when an event uh, you cannot face, you're not responsible of, uh, happens. Uh, we we have experienced uh, debt swaps for a long time at AFD. We are doing it in Cameroon, we are doing it for huge amounts in Côte d'Ivoire uh, right now. So we have the methodology uh, to, to, to do that and to provide the automaticity that mm. is asked for by uh, countries that are, that are affected by, by, by this uh, fe fe phenomenon. So we will invest in the, in the Global Shield, for instance, with Germany that, mm. was, uh, uh, that was announced. Um, and, and yes, no, the frontier with adaptation sometimes is not that clear, you know, you know that. So uh, we have to significantly increase uh, uh, finance for adaptation and loss and damage. And, and again, make it uh, as convincing uh, so that the other dimension of the climate agenda, meaning uh, Article 2.1c, uh, we negotiated back, uh, start being seriously uh, implemented. Wonderful, thank you. I'm st still not sure it's going to convince some of the 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 the, the, the least developed countries, but uh, it's it's good. Well, to know. you know, you know, sorry to say, but okay. uh, France uh, is now originating six billion uh, U.S. dollar climate finance each year. So uh, all NGOs and think tanks are 
it's grant and loans, concessional loans. I mean, this, 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 you will not develop and you will, face, you will not face climate change only with grants, uh, you know that. Uh, no, no country in the world has developed only with grants. I'm not, I'm not against grants. I mean, AFD is, is, is an agency and a bank, so we, we mobilize as much grant resources as we, as we need. But, but we need the whole array of financial instruments and financial innovation uh, so that we are at scale of uh, the challenges uh, uh, we are facing. So all, all think tanks, NGOs assessing what happened since COP21 are saying that at least France and a few other countries met uh, the objective. Actually, Macron increased. The commitment we made in Paris was 5 billion. Uh, and now we reached, uh, we reached uh, 6 billion, two for adaptation, so it's one third uh, progressing, so we hope to do more. We also attached um, biodiversity uh, to climate, so now 30% uh, um, of the climate finance project uh, AFD is financing uh, have a contribution to nature, so our, our rest on the nature-based solutions, because we feel the, the climate agenda is, uh, I will be in Montreal soon, but the climate agenda is stronger than the, uh, the, the biodiversity uh, agenda, so there's an interest in uh, attaching uh, the two of them so that we also increase finance for, finance for nature. Um, um, so, yes, I think we, may, we are making a credible effort to increase, and French ODA as a whole, you know, uh, uh, it's the budget that uh, increased the, the, the most uh, in France in the first mandate of President Macron. AFD doubled size, uh, including in terms of grant resources. So at the time, I mean, this has to be recognized also. Well, I've been covering the UK for yeah. the last few years and they, we know the UK certainly didn't do that, did they? Um. No, but this is why we're here, this is why President Macron took uh, s strong positions uh, mm. in the negotiation. I mean, he, he's willing to uh, make proposals with uh, Prime Minister Maya, Mia Motley before the spring meetings uh, uh, next year. So the, do not uh, doubt uh, French uh, and European uh, willingness uh, to have the system move in a better in a better uh, direction uh, i think we have evidence that we are doing it uh, but 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 it, it, it it's only remember in the paris agreement we also said that we have to redefine climate finance post 2025 uh, and so we have to seriously discuss this with all parties again from the position where we 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 are delivering on our commitment and we are increasing uh, the grant element uh, within our climate climate finance Are you interested in the intersection of business and social impact? Do you want to know how corporate sustainability, ESG, impact investing, and more can contribute to development finance? My name is Adva Saldinger. I'm a senior reporter at DevEx, and I've been reporting on these issues for nearly a decade. I'm the author of DevEx Invested, our free weekly newsletter dedicated to development finance. Every Tuesday, we explore how companies, investors, and market mechanisms are reshaping the world of development finance. Visit devex.com slash newsletters and join us on Tuesdays. Let's change tack slightly. Um, there's clearly a human rights problem in Egypt. Do you think it was correct that the UN chose to host the COP here? Well, it's, it's, it's the UN decision. Um, and uh, NGOs are in COP. Actually, I, I had a meeting yesterday with uh, many uh, colleagues from uh, NGOs, uh, maybe more climate uh, and uh, development uh, NGOs, uh, but there were also um, um, Egyptian uh, representatives. True to say that they were more about the climate uh, fight, and, and um, uh, uh, the finance in common I was referring to, uh, which is this um, gathering of all the public development banks in the world. So probably, I, I don't know if you know, there are 500 and more than 500 public development banks in the world. We're getting a bit far away from what I asked. No, I mean, no, no, like I, I come to that. The point is we met in Abidjan two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you, I, I refer to a declaration that was made 
in support of uh, human rights organization. I just want to insist that um, NG know, NGOs the, the are the part of the governance of finance in common, yeah. including human rights organization. But this is about so I invite you to ask them what they think sure, about the UN by in terms of what it actually does rather than making declarations has done something in practice which has clearly upset a lot of people and highlighted quite a big human rights crisis situation here. Was it correct that the UN did that? Ask the UN. I mean, uh, they, con they convened, uh, they invited all of us to come to Egypt uh, to try to have find solutions to face climate change. Uh, so we, we, we came in Egypt to do that. And actually, AFD, AFD is working in Egypt, so we know, we know the country. And we are assisting people here in Egypt with concrete investments for a long time. So we, we know a bit about uh, Egypt and we know a bit on how development can be linked to human rights. Uh, and we are taking positions for that, not only AFD, but public development banks uh, as, a, as a community. So France's nuclear capacity has made it a lot more resilient to the current energy crisis in, in Europe. As AFD, would you advocate for emerging economies to engage in, in nuclear power? Well, we are, a AFD, as you know it, uh, we took a very strong position last year in Glasgow. So we declared that we are coming out of fossil fuel, so no investment in, uh, in oil, of course, coal, gas. Um, uh, so we, we are focusing on renewable. So we are putting on our energy on renewable and we're not financing nuclear. No, 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 we're never financing nuclear. Then you, you, you <laughs> this is my position. This is what, this is the policy uh, decided by AFD's board. Okay. So in terms of uh, channeling SDRs, France has been pretty good at that. Um, do you, why do you think other rich countries haven't been so good at that? Well, you know, the, 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 there are technical, de technical issues about SDR. Uh, it's a tool of the monetary policy, so you have uh, um, central bankers uh, that are uh, um, defining, I would say, restrictions to the use of SDR, but, but there's a living debate about it, and, and true to say that uh, uh, President Macron is uh, leading on this, so you know, we first we uh, committed to on land 20% of our allocation, uh, and then uh, Macron announced that we will uh, push to 30% now. Uh, and he uh, repeatedly said uh, that there's one uh, channel which is uh, uh, most welcome uh, that goes through um, the IMF, uh, both uh, PRGF and this new uh, Resilience and Sustainability Trust that is beginning to flow. And that we should seriously explore the possibility to channel SDR um, through um, multilateral development banks. And for instance, President uh, Adesina, the CEO of uh, the African Development Bank, uh, uh, yesterday again repeated his proposal uh, to be a beneficiary of uh, um, uh, SDR allocation so that he can transfer these precious resources uh, to uh, its fellow, uh, his fellow uh, public banks in Africa. There are 100 public banks in Africa. Some of them, and many of them, are extremely credible. And they, have, they are n not concessional enough. They do not have the right uh, resources that multilateral could provide them at their regional, or being the World Bank, their global platform. Thanks a lot. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Merci. Thanks for listening to Copcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others you think would be interested in it. You can also leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. If you have some feedback about this episode that you want to share, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on social media at devix and at rumbichakamba underscore, or you can drop us an email at podcast at devix.com.